So you love podcasts and you want to listen to more amazing content, but you have no idea what to listen to. And your friends keep telling you about great episodes, yet you can never remember what they told you. Well, here's the answer. Good Pods. It's the social app dedicated to podcasts where your friends, podcast listeners, and favorite podcast hosts all come together to share on their feeds what they recommend and what they listen to. You can connect to others, bookmark episodes, start a conversation about the episode, connect to the hosts, and most importantly, listen to great podcasts right in the Good Pods app. Download Good Pods wherever you get your apps and start sharing with a community that loves to listen. Good Pods, it's where to connect and listen. This podcast has never been listened to. Do you see the old tagger on it? That's right. Brand new. Never been listened to. What? No, you can't listen. No one has ever heard it. Don't look anymore. You've looked at it long enough. Who am I kidding? No one would want to listen to Thrive Loud with Lou Diamond. It's time to take an inside look at those that are taking their lives, their businesses, and their passions to the next level. Get ready to thrive loud with Lou Diamond. Welcome everyone to another episode of Thrive Loud with Lou Diamond, connecting you to the most inspiring and amazing people that are thriving each and every day. I'm your host, Lou Diamond. Today on Thrive Loud, we have a New York Times your money columnist, New York Times and Wall Street Journal best-selling author for taking time off and the opposite of spoiled. His latest book, The Price You Pay for College, I think is also on this list, which is just crazy, is turning heads everywhere and is the must read for everyone. Thrive Loud listeners coming to us from Brooklyn, New York, Ron Lieber. Ron, how are you today? I am hanging in. How about you? <laughs> hanging in exactly. It's a tough week. We'll cover that part of this in this conversation, but we are good. First of all, congratulations on all your success. And listeners are going to hear a little background here. Uh, when when Ron came out with the opposite of spoiled, a spectacular read, by the way, for every parent required reading that really gives a great value of money, of how to value money and spending and whatnot. He did a spectacular job of it. The book kind of ran through the livelihood of children pretty much right up to going to college. And Ron spoke to a group of people in my hometown, and I was absolutely amazed at how good a presenter it is. We, we chatted afterwards about his you know, presentation things. We were bouncing feedback ideas off each other. And all I kept saying was, I can't wait till the next book comes out because you could see where it was leading to. So with that little introduction, Ron, um, that's where it was leading to, was it not? After one book to the next, can we talk about that journey from one to the next spot? We can. You totally smelled it on me. Uh, you weren't the only one, but it was right. a you know large handful of perceptive people that saw what was about to happen. And here's what happened. You know, back in 2013, when I was starting the reporting for The Opposite of Spoiled, I knew that book had to end somewhere, right? It couldn't be about how and when and why to talk to your kids about money when your kids were 42, right? So there, there needed to be an, an end point. And I knew it started at age three or four. So when was it going to end? And so, you know, I start that reporting and it becomes clear to me very quickly that the college thing looms so large. It's such a large number that it was probably going to need to be hived off, right? That the book needed to end effectively when, when kids were age 16. And that one of the biggest reasons for being for the opposite of spoiled was that the college number is so large that you need to kind of get your kids ready to understand numbers that size and to put them into context, right? So you need to yeah. be introducing four-year-olds and six-year-olds and 10-year-olds and 13-year-olds and 16-year-olds to ever larger numbers and, and numbers that impact your family so that they can have some sense of context when and the college stuff comes along. So I thought that was all very tidy and convenient. But as I was doing the homework for the opposite of spoiled, I just kept running into like adjacent conversations about this college thing. And so I started to sense that there was something there. And I was just tossing, you know, that evidence and the stories and the studies into a separate Google Drive. And eventually that document became so big 
that it was obvious to me that there was another book there, but I wasn't sure what it was. And it actually took a bunch of readers um, who unknowingly educated me on what that was, but that took a couple years longer. Yeah. So this is really a perfect segue because I'll, I'll peel the curtain on my side of the coin. I have two college age children. And for most of our listeners, uh, they're the educated group that we cater to. These are college educated listeners and they have plans to potentially have their kids go to college or have already gone through it, have had to deal with college itself. When you first start understanding how expensive college is, it is, it's almost a, a mind melt like an absolute piece. What, what I wanted to do, which I think was really cool because I heard you share this story and to somebody who has an appreciation of, of money and to find value in certain things, let's start off. Can you share your own personal college tuition story, which I had learned from when you spoke, I think our listeners will appreciate it. And also an understanding of, of the system and the value and all the, the craziness of just how, what an effort it is to, to get to college, to, to financially afford this, this, this big education piece, which has become very essential to progressing in certain careers and stages that you might need to move on in life. Yeah. So there's a reason that I grew up to be the person who helps people beat the system for a living. <laughs> and, um, you know, and it, it goes back to when I was in high school, because, you know, my family had been doing very well. And then my parents split up, one of my parents lost their job. And, you know, we ended up on scholarship at the, the private school that I was attending for, you know, a good six years. And, you know, my family had not really kind of clawed its way back financially at, at the point at which I was applying to college. And so, I was going to need financial aid in college and the college counselor at our, at our high school only knew so much about the system. Right. And so he gave us a name of, of this guy, like the guy to see in the Chicagoland area, if you needed some help sorting out how the financial aid system worked. And so we call this guy up and he gives us this address on Hinman street in Evanston, Illinois. We drive up there the following Tuesday as instructed with $50 in cash. Uh, <laughs> and, and we go in the side door, which we didn't think much of at the time. Although, uh, you know, 20 some years later, uh, you know, the bribery scandal in college admissions right. came to be known as the side door scandal because this was how uh, this crooked dude, Rick Singer, um, referred to what he was doing. So um, what we were doing was, was not illegal. Um, but we did go in through the side door. And what we discovered, right, was that the side door of this building, this was the Office of Financial Aid at Northwestern University. Amazing. And the guy to see, he was the assistant dean of financial aid at Northwestern. And he had this crazy side hustle going where at five o'clock every day after his colleagues were gone, he would usher these families into the office and you'd give them the 50 bucks and he would reveal all of the secrets of the financial aid system and tell you how to fill out your, what was then known as the FAF form. And to do so, you know, to make yourself look as needy as possible without crossing any legal or ethical lines. And it turned out this guy knew exactly what he was talking about. Uh, I got into Amherst uh, early decision where I, I, I met your better half. Um, yep. And, uh, and I got a great financial aid package. And we went back and, you know, renegotiated it as as this guy in Evanston had instructed us to do uh, every year and asked for a little more money. And we always got some. And that was a real lesson for me that the grown up world was just chock filled with complex systems involving money, and they were made to be hacked. Yeah. And so now I was going to be the hacker. I and you are that time, but I was yeah. going to be the hacker. I was going to be the white hat legal hacker. And that was going to be my livelihood. And it's true for the listeners. If you read his columns in the New York Times, he's always finding ways to, to take the, the, the hack around a certain financial situation, uh, something you need to buy, something you need to plan for. And, and, he's, and he's brilliant with it. And these books have been awesome. But I want to now visit now. I, I know you said 20 something, but we're going to date ourselves here. It's almost 30 years now since that process, right? Or actually More 31. 30, actually. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so now we're 30 some odd years in the future. And now what the price of college is today is amplified probably more than what the cost of living has been and where inflation has gone. The price we pay for college, um, this is now also not only a challenge for every individual, but it is, it, it has become a question of value. Mm -hmm. And let's just hit it right at home. 
is college worth what you get out of it at the end of the day? Well, gosh, I mean, <laughs> uh, where to start with that? So, I mean, let's- I only ask big questions <laughs> to open this. I wanted to, we could drill down any way you wanted, but I wanted to ask you- Yeah, one. I mean, look, it's the question at the center of the book. So, you know, it's only fair that you, um, that you hit it right on the nose. Um, so let's start here, right? Let's start with what has changed dramatically because you, you nod to it, but let's just name it. Um, first of all, the list prices- the retail prices have have indeed gone up at more than the rate of inflation, yeah. um, and at you know three hundred dollar or three hundred thousand dollars for four years more than that <laughs> actually if we want to send our kids to uh, you know Janet and and my alma mater, um, even people who have achieved the success that you and I have in life can't just go around writing three hundred thousand right. dollar checks per kid after taxes, right? So even people who have done really well are looking at this and being just like, wow, how, how did this happen? What is going on here? And then at the same time, um, that pretty complex system of need-based financial aid that I navigated over 30 years ago, that still exists, but a separate system has hived itself off that's running parallel on a parallel set of train tracks that's become known as merit aid. And at all but the 40 or 50 most selective colleges and universities in the country, both public and private, that system now exists too. And there are unpublished discounts that have nothing to do with your financial status and what you have and everything to do with who you are or who your teenager is as a student, as a test taker, as a leader, and, and in other ways that are not necessarily trackable, right? So, so that's, sort of what's, that's sort of what's going on, right? That's the system as it exists today, the system that we're trying to understand first and then beat second, and then maybe break, uh, you know, eventually. Uh, um, and so, so that's the playing field for this discussion of value, right? But before you can begin to assess that, you kind of have to ask some overarching questions about what college actually is. And this should have been necessary 31 years ago, but because it didn't feel like it cost quite as much, um, people didn't necessarily force themselves to ask the hard questions. But now I think we sort of have to, right? So first, there are two fundamental questions um, of human existence, of any endeavor worth pursuing, and certainly in the realm of, of sales, but also in the realm of college, which is what is the definition of success and how much is enough? Mm. Now, I, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're working for somebody, um, they, you know, they, they set benchmarks for you, right? And if you're in sales, it's probably a number, right? If you work for yourself, you're setting your own benchmarks and that's more psychologically complex. In the realm of college, it's a real mess emotionally, right? Because there's all the fear and guilt and snobbery and elitism that comes with, you know, being a parent and having achieved some measure of success yourself, perhaps, and trying to figure out, you know, are your kids going to equal you? Are they going to surpass you if they don't in terms of where they get in or what you're able or willing to pay? Like, what does that say about you? What does that say about them? Blah, 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 right? It's a total head trip. Um, so what is the definition of success? Uh, how much is enough? And then you have to define for yourself what college actually is. Like, what are we shopping for here, right? Because at possibly $300,000 or even $100,000, if they go to, you know, Binghamton or New Paltz or, you know, um, uh, SUNY Albany, um, you know, we sort of need to know what it is that we're trying to buy in order to make a good um, consumer decision. So what is college? You know, I kept asking people this question. I heard the same three things over and over. College is number one, about the education. It's about having your brain disassembled and reassembled by expert practitioners uh, and molded into a bigger and better version of its former self, right? That's number one. It's the intellectual roller coaster. Uh, it's the experience of a lifetime if you, if, you, if you use it well, and most kids don't because 18-year-olds shouldn't go to college in the first place. Um, but that's a conversation for another time. Number two, you are shopping for kinship, right? 
you know, you want Janet Diamond in your life 31 years later and, you know, a couple hundred people like her, uh, you know, to, to, to have your back and show up at your book events and to, and to carry you through life. Um, you are not just shopping for a collection of peers, um, but you are shopping for mentors. Um, you're looking for the best opportunity, the highest possible odds of finding the grownups who can impact you, who you can have a, you know, a deep personal relationship with and who will see something in you that you cannot see in yourself and will grab you by the collar or the scruff of your neck if, if necessary and drag you into that better version of yourself. So that's number two, you're buying kinship. Number three, you are buying a credential. And maybe, right, if you're the first person in your family to go to college, right, the credential itself is enough. And what you are hoping to do more than anything is establish a stable middle-class life for yourself. And so you're trying to get through the pre-med program, or you're trying to get that BSN in nursing, or you're trying to get a teaching certificate with your BA, or you're trying to become an accountant and pass the CPA exam. And you hope that that'll, you know, give you the stability that you didn't have growing up and will allow you to throw the rope back for your parents or your siblings or whoever else doesn't manage to get to or through college. Or, yeah. you know, maybe you're more like me. Um, in retrospect, this is what I was, right? You're, you're going um, to an institution that is more selective and more prestigious than the one that your parents were, um, were able to attend. And you're looking for that institution to open doors to you that your family and whatever inherited privilege that you have, um, you know, would not enable you to do. And that's what Amherst was um, for me. And uh, I always try to make allowance for um, for people who have that level of ambition, because I guess I sort of did, although I hadn't identified it at the time. Right. So um, so the credential. So those are the three reasons to go to college. And so, you know, until you, you answer the, what is the definition of success and how much is enough? And until you identify which of those three things are most important to you, or if only one is, right? I'm not making right. any judgments here. The only judgment I'm making is um, on people who don't ask themselves the hard questions and who are not emotionally honest with themselves about all the possible answers. Because until you really walk through that, right? First on your own in your head, then with your spouse, if you have one, certainly with your ex, if you have one of those, because you don't want to be <laughs> fighting about this and you want to be united. That's right. Or yeah. if you're parenting alone, you know, with a therapist or financial planner or someone who you just trust implicitly and explicitly until you have done that work, you can't even begin to yeah. shop, let alone assess value. So it's great that you're bringing up the shopping part, because in the same spirit about the two tracks of the funding and financial aid of merit and, and financial aid that could happen out there. As we're looking at parents or students who are shopping for colleges, there are colleges shopping for students. And this is something that you've covered in here that I think is maybe the most eye-opening part of what this whole book is. Can you address at a little level, we'll give all the links for the book, about what's going on where the universities are tracking the interests and how of students and how they're doing it. I'm so glad that you're homing in on this um, because uh, you know different people have had wildly different reactions to the book and have seized on different things. And I'm so glad that people with sales and marketing and business sense are, are seizing on this and thinking about how it applies to their own lives because it yes. does, right? We think of this, we don't even think of this as an industry, right? Um, but first of all, this is an industry, right? Billions and billions and billions of dollars are being thrown around each year. It's an industry, right? And we don't think about the sales and marketing aspect of this as actual sales and marketing. We think of this as Tweety people in elbow patches, smoking pipes, <laughs> You know, with with <laughs> sheets of paper trying right. to make decisions about kind of who comes and, and, and who doesn't. But that's not how this goes right outside of the, you know, 40 or 50 more most selective institutions in the country. Um, there is a, a, a market fissure, a fracture, a slow growing crack that grows ever so much wider each and every year. And, and it basically can be explained like this. Um, people with the ability to pay these list prices, and there are actually a few more of them each and every year because of income inequality, which is something mm -hmm. that people miss when looking at demographics here. People with the ability to pay 
are increasingly questioning whether they should have the willingness to do so. And I focused my reporting on the part of the list of schools where the ability and the willingness um, were, were not the same, right? Where there was, there was some question about that, right? So imagine a, imagine a list, you know, throw all of the, um, throw all of the colleges uh, in the country together um, and rank them, you know, in order of selectivity, right? For lack of a, lack of a better way to do it. And so in other words, you know, Stanford's up at the top because they only accept 3% of their students. <laughs> right. And it sort of falls down from there. So right about slot 50, or maybe it's 42, or maybe it's 50, 54, right? Um, right around there is where the, where the messiness starts, um, where at, um, at Tulane and at Northeastern and at USC and at Kenyon and at Oberlin and at McAllister and at Occidental, um, people with the ability to pay are wondering whether those places are actually worth $75,000 a year. And they've decided an increasing number that they are not, right? And so what have those institutions had to do? Um, They have had to throw money at mostly affluent people uh, to convince them to come. And with those 10 and 15 and 20 and 25 and 30 and sometimes $50,000 annual coupons that they hand off to our teenagers, they are engaged in sales and marketing to try and convince a kid who could otherwise go to Cornell or Williams or Pomona to come instead to Oberlin or USC or Tulane at a $100,000 discount yep. over four years. And so that's where it starts. Farther down the food chain, it gets even more weird, but that's kind of where it starts. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address this directly to something that I experienced as a parent. Uh, when my son was applying to school, I'm going to give them a shout out because I could not get over how good the marketing campaign was on their aspect. And this was to Swarthmore College. Swarthmore College looks like they hired the creative director from JetBlue. And they had advertising communications that came in such a funny, almost little sarcastic tone, poking fun of this process of coming into the colleges and the language they use and the things that they send out in mailings, in glossy stuff and websites. And, and I go, I got to find this head of marketing because this is, this is genius how good they are. And I could see how they would need to be effective because of where they fit exactly in the, the examples you were giving. They'd be in that same window of having to try to compete with the others. And we were watching and I go, they're doing a good job. I go, I don't know that much. I knew about the school, but now I knew much more. And I also had an appreciation for it in your research did you get a chance to see different tactics or ways that these universities were trying to better engage their, these, these, these markets, for lack of a better, to productize the students of the world? Sure. So in terms of breaking down a particular drip campaign, right, <laughs> a, 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 and analyzing a sales funnel from top to bottom, and this is how they talk about it behind the scenes. They use the real language, yeah. right? Um, in terms of analyzing a sales funnel from front to back, I did not get there in the reporting, and okay. I, I I do regret it now. And I'm going to get it done for the newspaper. I I'm not going to reveal right now exactly how, um, sure. but I've 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 got some I've got some spies in the house. Um, <laughs> I've, got, I've got some got some got some work cooking on that. Um, and um, I, you know, Swarthmore is a really interesting case because they are right at the bottom. They're like right on the border of having to start throw money, start to throw money around at affluent people because it, Swarthmore has a particular problem. Swarthmore has a, a problem that University of Chicago has. Um, that Columbia University has, although less so because New York City is so hot right now. But you know, there's a sense that Swarthmore is where fun goes to die. Oh. It's, wow. it's okay. considered an extremely academic and somewhat quirky and not particularly fun place. And that's what they need to get over in their marketing, because if people continue to believe that it's so, they're going to have to start paying the best students to go there. And they don't want to they don't want to go there. They're 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 afraid of that. Um, huh. And so they haven't had to do it yet. They're not offering this, right. this so-called merit aid yet, but they're but they're but they're but 
you know, they probably fear that they may have to, um, and uh, hence the sophisticated marketing. But, you know, here's what I do know, and I have watched, um, the amount of outbound marketing to, you know, 15 and 16 and 17 year olds um, who have not clicked the negative checkoff when they take the PSAT that would keep all of this stuff from coming at them, including on their cell phones now. Um, right. A lot of this marketing is outwardly financial, uh, incredibly pecuniary, right? I mean, there's literally email that comes in that, that with the subject heading, show me the money, <laughs> right. right? And so um, if you think that, you know, if you're one of these parents who has managed to figure out how this merit aid bidding for students stuff with, with real money, uh, real cash money, tens of thousands of dollars in discounts, if you've managed to figure out that this is going on and you've managed to figure out how this works and you've managed to do so before your kid starts high school, my hat's off to you because it's actually a teeny tiny number of people. But of the people who have figured that out, some people, a subset of them, particularly ones who, you know, are say adolescent psychologists um, or armchair adolescent psychologists, psychologists are like, you know what, I'm not going to tell my kid that this is going on. I'm not going to tell their tell my kid that their high school grades could be worth $100,000 in discounts because right. they already have enough pressure on them. And so I'm not going right. to put this pressure on them too. And so if you think you can hide this from your children, you have another thing coming because the expert marketers at Swarthmore or at um, Clark University in Worcester, which is the school that sent out the show me the money emails, or right. at like hundreds of other places, they've got your kid's number. They literally have got your kid's number <laughs> and they're going to start throwing money at their cell phones. Mm. They do it already. So, so in the, I, I know there's a combination here because I want to, I want to pare down your brilliance and your superpowers here into what this book is about and what you learned. And I want to know what the aha moment was for you as you were doing the research and trying to understand the answer to the question of the book, which is the, the, the title we will plug and give all the pieces, the price you pay for college. And what you were finding as you were putting this story together, what was like the, oh my God, I did not know that part that might will, will eventually lead you down exactly as you said to hacking and figuring out what the better, how to break the system or hack the system is. What was the aha moment that you did not know as you went on to research this information? Sure. I, I'd say there were two moments. One of them was, um, so I had an understanding before the reporting started. This, this ends up being a revelation to a lot of readers, but I had an understanding before the reporting started that just about every college in America, um, certainly all the privates and, and many of the publics, had a consultant working behind the scenes, not just doing the marketing that you described, but also ingesting all manner of demographic data about your community, about your high school, about the historic performance of applicants and matriculants from your community and from your high school at the institution, and also the ones who had turned them down, right? And then sucking in a whole bunch of data, not just about your SAT score and your zip code, which is code for affluence, as all your listeners know, um, but also, <laughs> um, but also, uh, like how often your kids and were clicking on links and yeah. how quickly they were responding to text messages and all that's being fed into a, a giant algorithm with essentially limitless appetites. Um, and it, it all gets ingested. And then what comes out is a custom crafted discount offer to your family and your kid if and when you apply and get in that is designed to be just enough to get you to say yes, but not a dollar more. And it is computers that's, that are doing that work. And so the revelation mm -hmm. for me was when somebody finally let me in the house. Um, somebody let me in the house and opened up their laptop and blasted it onto a, you know, a giant screen and I got to actually see how all this stuff worked. And wow. it was, you know, a, a revelation for me that, oh yeah, like a billion dollars is getting spent all told on, you know, personnel and consulting and software and marketing and tracking, you know, each year. And of course it is, right? Because yeah. this is an industry with like a couple thousand players and it's competitive and it's, you know, lights out for any of these institutions if they miss their number by a lot over a couple of straight years. Because most institutions don't have a giant endowment. They've got to keep putting heads in beds, right? These right. are sales and marketing organizations uh, as much as they are institutions of high higher learning. And most people just don't get it. When I got in the house, I got to see it. Right. So, um, 
So that's the biggest one. There was another one, which I've now forgotten. Um, <laughs> well, well, I'll let, well, I'll let you think of what that other aha moment is, yeah. or I'll do some creative editing. Um, <laughs> so he, here's, here's a question that's relevant. And this is probably the one that, that rang true at the time that your book has just come out. We just went through the most unprecedented year in our lifetimes. And obviously about a hundred years ago, since uh, we had a global pandemic, and to speak to someone who had two kids who had to deal with college, I can imagine the, the universe of people of what the college experience was like, summarizing it quickly, not the ideal learning experience you want to do it virtually via Zoom or whatever. And it did add a lot of questions on whether it made sense, not just from a health perspective, but from a, from a value perspective as a student, the experience, so all the things that you ran through on what you think college is, a lot of it didn't meet up to what college was this past year. And helping people address and understand and look at this stuff, this, this was one of the biggest learnings ever because, yeah, they realize they can get by on educating things. And the students will tell you they can't wait to go back to a normal experience. But we do know that they'll take some lessons from this, from a virtual component of how to do things and whatnot. Can you give a little preview because you have that ability to look ahead as to your two cents and what you think is going to happen from what the universities are going to take from this interesting experience as we try to get back to a more normal learning curve and what college could become? Because talk about a value question. I think a lot of kids are shaking their heads going, was it really worth it? I don't think a damn thing is going to change. Um, and here's why, uh, you know, if you look at um, any and every industry that you partake of as a consumer or that you work in as a professional or that you are even adjacent to as a professional, is there a single one that has changed less in a generation than the delivery of residential undergraduate education? Uh, it's, it's such a great point. You're hundred percent right. The dorms are no, it would be the answer is nothing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's you know, there's, there's some nicer stuff at some of these places. Um, but, you know, the, I mean, it's only natural that there's nicer stuff because a lot of these, you know, colleges had 19th century buildings and, you know, eventually they break down or they're, they're not right. worth, ma worth maintaining um, or, the, you know, they, they just, you know, the, there's modernization that needs to happen in terms of infrastructure. Right. But like nothing else really about the experience has changed at all. And that's how they like it. Right. Um, and in fact, more and more people um, have been clamoring for it because, uh, you know, the institutions, uh, many of them, right, have, have, or many of the most selective ones have only gotten more selective. Right. So why, why should they change? Now, that, that, that's not a rhetorical question. Um, you change when some steam locomotive comes roaring at you um, or, you know, sneaks up on you uh, when you're not looking, you don't even realize that you're on dangerous train tracks. But what has, what has this actually proven to us? What, what, you know, in terms of what happened in the pandemic, um, what has it proved to us? So I, I had, on, on one hand, I, I kind of gave myself a pass, to, you know, to giving people short-term advice because I was writing a book for the long haul. And I knew, or at least I thought, right, that this was, this was going to go away relatively quickly. I, I think we may be, you know, looking at at least five semesters of impact, maybe more, because college kids are not going to get vaccinated this spring and they're not going to get vaccinated this fall. Um, I don't think. Uh, and so maybe. maybe we'll see. We'll see. We, I'd we'll love see. to be I'd love to be wrong about that, but at least yeah. four semesters of impact. And so in March, um, we pushed pause on the publication of The Price You Pay for College um, because we figured this would all work itself out in a couple of months and I could you know, tie it up in a tidy bow and, and it would all be fine. And um, it had not uh, worked itself out at all. Um, but you know, I was watching what was going on and here's my assessment of what happened. So remember before we were talking about the three reasons you go to college. You go for the education, you go for the kinship, you go for the credential. So all these schools shut down the second week of March. Everybody goes home. And very quickly, it becomes clear that the education sucks, right? <laughs> now, this is, this is not the fault of the institutions because right. this wasn't what they were built to do. And you can't expect a bunch of professors to turn on a dime and create magic in Zoom rooms. But so it's no surprise that it didn't happen and that it was terrible and people sued for tuition refunds and didn't get them, right? Um, 
So uh, the education is extremely compromised. Uh, the kinship is obliterated because everybody's in their bedrooms. And, you, and even if you wanted to, you, you couldn't at that point go hang out with people. Um, and only the cred credential survived intact. But, you know, how much was that worth, right? Or imagine you're, you know, an undergrad at like the Cornell Hotel and Restaurant School. Like, what was that credential worth in the spring of 2020? God help you if that was your, if that was your lot in life or your intended, um, uh, you know, vocational destination. And then what happened in September? Everybody came flocking back to the extent that the schools were willing to open everybody showed up. I mean, it's some of the most elite institutions, a, a bunch of people took gap years, um, but everybody wanted to be together. And even at schools that would not allow students to come back and live there, people potted up with their kin, you know, to try and create a better intellectual like, experience for themselves, you know, in group houses right next to campus often, or sometimes halfway around the country, right? So what does that tell us? People actually like this. Yeah. This this residential undergraduate experience that, you know, we're trying to figure out the actual value of people were willing to come running back to it at full price with no discounts, even though the, the system has been and, and remains extremely compromised and a whole bunch of them got sick. None of this made any sense at all. <laughs> None of it made any sense. And yet people came running back to it. Why? Well, for one reason or another, rightly or wrongly, residential undergraduate education has become a sort of rite of passage in this country, such yeah. that it feels like an entitlement to kids in the middle class and above. And parents weren't about to say, this is ridiculous, or at least most parents didn't say that. And so what else were people going to do? Right. Um, they all came back. And because everybody came back, what reason do these schools have to change? And yeah. what would they change that wouldn't actually make it worse and make it feel more like, you know, the cut rate version of, of what people were experiencing in the spring? I, I just, I, they have, they have, they've got no reason to change. Spectacular response to this. L before we go to the admin part and we get to fun street here on Thrive Loud, I got to do this because I'm very curious. Uh, look, you've been Congrats, by the way, on your third New York Times bestseller. It's freaking awesome. You've been thriving as a writer and at the Times all these years. And I love to say those that are thriving, you know, they, they got it going on. But we all have days when we're not quite kicking on all cylinders. Ron, when you have trouble thriving, who or what practice do you seek to get yourself back on the thriving track? Um. I mean, I'm just looking behind me at the sort of, you know, the, the stuff that I've got, I've got written in various places, right? Um, so uh, I'm, I'm looking on the, the desktop machine over there, and I've got a couple of um, signs on either side, and one says deep reporting, and the other one says deep empathy. Mm -hmm. And this was something this was something beautiful that uh, a, a friend of mine, a colleague said to me a couple of years ago about how she felt like my reporting was marked by both deep reporting and deep empathy. So I look at that and I say, you know what, there's a whole bunch of people out there who are actually counting on you um, to deliver, you know, this week in the column or or this half decade in the latest book in the way that you already have. And, you know, you, you, you owe them your best effort and it will feel good to deliver on it. It will feel good. It's a, it's an act of, of selfishness, right? Um, you know, we know this from the studies about, you know, philanthropy, right. Or volunteer work. It feels good to help other people and however, you know, crappy I might be feeling in any particular moment. Um, it's going to feel good to, to do this. Well, it's going to make a difference to people. Um, and then, um, Hang on, let's see if I can read this other one without pulling the laptop off. All right. <laughs> Number one, what do you want to be true in the world? Number two, who will your allies be if you can persuade them? Oh, I like that. So I've got this platform, right? You've got a platform. I've got a platform. We've got these platforms, right? So what kind of army? 
can we raise if we do it right today, right? If we don't give up and we remember that like, if we do this right, there's gonna be a whole bunch of Lou Diamonds and Ron Liebers out there, you know, with new ideas who are amped up to put them to work in the world, right? I love so, it. So I'm, so I'm thinking about that army. Like what, what, is, what is this army that I'm gonna raise? And then I think about Money equals feelings. Then I think about that. So this comes from Carl Richards, the author of the the Behavior Gap. He's the single most influential you know person in my career. Um, mm. I edited him for a decade at the New York Times um, when he wrote the Sketch Guy column, and I just you know, and I, I try to remind myself of that too. It's not so much a get up off That's your right. butt or feel better. It's just a reminder that um, that you know, it, it, everything I touch or everything I should be touching professionally should be grounded in, you know, the emotions that can lead us astray when making big financial decisions. And maybe on any given day when I'm not feeling it, um, I should, you know, try and think harder about what they, what that feeling um, is, right? And um, whether I, I am in fact scared of the topic that I'm having trouble addressing personally, because I have my own feelings about my own money um, or the part of my money or my family's money that is um, at the root of the thing that I'm reporting on, right? So maybe I'm scared, maybe I'm personally scared of it. Um, and I'm gonna you know, exercise all of those demons and or, you know, pay it back to the, you know, that dude in Evanston and, and people yeah. like him um, by getting it right in the newspaper and getting it right for a whole bunch of people. Let's do the admin part of the show, Ron. Share everybody where they can find uh, the, the, the book, websites, URLs, social media, stuff like that. We will put it all in the show notes, but it always gets more engagement when they hear it directly from you. Sure. So I am easily found at ronlieber.com. That's L-I-E-B as in boy, E-R. Uh, you can learn more about my books there. You can send me a note. Um, there are links there to, um, to buy the books and, um, and you can sign up for my newsletter there too, uh, you know, where I shoot notes from time to time from people to tell them about projects that I'm working on or ask for help or, you know, share something that I think would be useful. And I'm on all the, you know, usual social media outlets uh, at Ron Lieber, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and on Facebook, I'm facebook.com slash Ron Lieber author. And the price you pay for college is available anywhere the books are sold. And if you like my voice or if you just like ingesting content via vocal, uh, um, you know, vocal, uh, vocal output, uh, I did record uh, the audiobook for the price you pay for college myself. Very nice. I like it. I've been, I've done a bunch of audiobooks as you, we've talked about audio uh, content beforehand. It's very hard, by the way, it's very hard to do the books. It's always a tough one, yeah. uh, but only I only do factual ones, any drama type books that, that doesn't happen. Fiction, not happening. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 could, I, I have great admiration for the people who can make it up. I will never be a fiction writer, but you know, even the nonfiction isn't always easy. I mean, if you're putting any of yourself into it, uh, you know, I, I had to stop like four times reading the acknowledgements of the book because, uh, you know, when I was recording the audio, I kept bursting into tears. Mm. Let's uh, let's go to Fun Street, if you would, Ron. Ready to go there? Yeah. Okay. The way the way this works here is uh, first of all, let's start off with the basic one. Uh, can you share with the listeners an all time favorite movie? You know, first of all, I just want to I just want to thank you for doing this because um, I feel like there's a deficit of fun in the world right now, and, and we need it. And even even those of us who are you know luckier than average or luckier than most. Uh, are feeling it and um, any opportunity to sort of inject it anywhere is is something that I appreciate and something I'm trying to do a better job of in my own life. So I just want to thank you for that. So anyway, let's well, go. Then you're going to love this. So, so first of all, sh share with the listeners a movie that you love or an all time favorite movie of yours. You know, speaking of lack of fun, um, there just has not been enough time for film in the last <laughs> five or 10 or really 15 years back. of my life. But, right. you know, if we're talking about the most fun movie of all time or that I appreciate for its fun, it has to be Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I am a Chicago kid. I still identify as a Chicagoan. Among other things, that book is an ode to Chicago and Chicago places. And, uh, you know, it's, it's John Hughes at its best. 
It is great. And uh, just listening to, you know, let my Cameron go. It's one of my favorites. I love that movie. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going to do the fun street component here on, and I'm very interested to see where this goes. Okay. I am going to ask you a question and you're going to give the first thing that pops into your mind. These are things that lift you up, make you feel good, motivate you, make you thrive. Are you ready? Ready. Okay. A song you love to hear or that pumps you up. Uh, the song that I've been listening to most recently is Aspera, A-S-P-E-R-A -E by Aaron McKeown. And that's M-C-K-E-O-W-N. If you want to link to it in the show notes, uh, you can find uh, a great live version of it on YouTube. A favorite food that's not a dessert. Stuffed spinach pizza from Giordano's in Chicago, which is available to be drop shipped via FedEx, via FedEx to uh -huh. any doorway in America, including mine on a not infrequent basis. I love how Chicagoans love their pizza. A favorite dessert. Uh, last night, uh, Steve Burwell, Amherst College class of 93, uh, brought over a giant tray of the bread pudding that we used to make from some old cookbook in 1993 in Somerville, Massachusetts. And it was awesome. Oh, wow. An activity you wish you did more of? Running. I'm going to try and run the Chicago Marathon a few months after my 50th birthday this year. And nice. right now in the cold and, and amid the crazy of book launch, I'm not doing enough of it. An activity you wish you did less of. I wish I spent less time right now unloading the dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. That's There's awesome. There's so many dishes right now. There's so many dishes. I actually, I don't mind the hand washing, right? But the, but, but the dishwasher. Uh. Oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> Ron, if you could snap your fingers and go anywhere in the world, where are you? I've never been to Kauai. Uh, I want to. I want to. Um, I want to cross that off the list with my family. We've been lucky enough to, you know, get to get to Maui and get to the Big Island, and uh, you know, we've been through Honolulu for the Saturday farmers market. But Kauai just seems spectacular, and it's high up on our list. Listeners need to know, uh, Ron. Ron, this has been truly a pleasure. Obviously, we've know each other, and through through my wife, your classmates. But I want to give a special shout out to you and your family. Ron just recently, uh, his, his dad just passed away and we were going to reschedule this interview, but he wanted to go do it and have it. And uh, let's give it a tribute to him. And obviously our condolences and uh, thoughts out to you um, and to your family. Thank you for taking the time here today, but mostly thanks for connecting and doing what you do every day. I think those messages you have on the wall are the inspiration that truly highlight not only why you are an amazing writer and a very valuable person in this world, but why you thrive loud. So thank you for coming on the program today, my friend. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And to all the listeners out there, thank you for joining us. And until next time, keep driving onward and upward. And remember, be brief, be bright, be gone. You've been listening to Thrive Loud with your host, Lou Diamond. Check us out on the web at thriveloud.com and follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook at Thrive Loud. And check us out on the Good Pods app at Thrive Loud, where you can follow, listen, and connect directly to Lou and all of the Thrive Loud episodes. Thanks for listening.